Today we're taking a first look at the brand new Cannondale Habit HT2. Back when I started mountain biking, Cannondale was the dream bike to have and they're still going strong with some killer bikes and I've been excited about this. The new Habit HT, their hardtail, their aggressive trail hardtail. I always love to review under $1,500 bikes with good geometry and uh, that's where this is today. So this is the Habit HT, HT for hardtail. The Habit HT3 is the same frame, $300 cheaper, same frame, same geo, just different components on this. And to have a 130 mil hardtail with great geo is amazing. This is where hardtails should be. They should be affordable to the masses and get you a great trail experience without, you know, costing $7,000. Now a $7,000 hardtail is a thing of beauty and we still feature those on this channel, but a $12 to $1,500 hardtail like what we've got here is way more capable than people realize. Okay, let's get this unpackaged so that we can see what's underneath here and take a closer look. Now this won't affect most people because you're going to be buying from a dealer, but the cable routing's funky. It's kind of funky that this shifter goes in here and then the brake goes in over here. Usually those two stick together, especially because we're going to have to run the dropper in there anyway. And then the front on the fork, this should be routed through here so it pops up in here. Not the end of the world for me. It just feels like, oh man, was someone not paying super close attention to this when they did it? So that's one small thing I would improve. All of those are easily fixed. I don't know if it's worth it to me to reroute the shifter through there. If I were keeping this bike, I absolutely would. But for a ride review, I might just leave it as it is. I don't know if it's worth the 15 minutes of pulling that through. All right, I decided this was worth routing the cables the right way. I'm a little bit frustrated. I'm a half an hour in. All right, she's all built up. This is the Habit 2 in this beautiful dark cherry color. Final weight came in at 33.9 pounds. That's a hefty little bike. I'm running tubes in here. These wheels are tubeless ready, but they don't have rim tape. We're seeing that on a lot of companies these days are not running rim tape on there. So um, in order to get them tubeless ready, you're gonna have to pull the tubes, pull the tire, pull the rim protector strip or leave it and then tape it, then get valves and then seal it to make it tubeless. We have a dual compound DHF front and we have a 3C high roller 2 in the rear. Uh, usually I see the 3C stickier compound in the front and then the more durable in the rear because the rears usually run out first. But I'm guessing this is a game of, hey, is there a tire in stock? Great, put it on our bikes and we're shipping it out. A lot of bike companies are still encountering stock issues when building these up. So yeah, it came in fairly heavy, but for a sub $1,500 bike, we've got some really, really great things going on and a couple things I think shouldn't be going on. I'll talk about those a little bit. This Habit 2 has a Cannondale bar and stem. Um, we've got 165 mil cranks. That's probably the first hardtail I've seen coming out with 165 mil cranks and I love seeing that. We have MicroShift Advent X 1x10 drivetrain, fantastic drivetrain. That is an excellent place to save money to make bikes more affordable. I'm running this on some of my $5,000 bikes. I just love this drivetrain. It's worked out really well for me. SRAM level brakes. Up front, we've got a RockShox Judy. Uh, I'm a little bit disappointed by that. It's a 32 mil stanchion fork. It just I don't know, I haven't had great experiences with the Judy's myself, but at least it's an air adjustable fork. But man, when you compare it to something like the Giant Fathom, spec-wise, the Fathom has that much better fork. And another weird thing they did is, this is a size medium, it comes with a 120 mil dropper. We've got a super short seat tube, tons of standover, but a really tiny little dropper. I could probably run a 175 on this with how long it is, but even the large and extra larges are only running a 130 dropper, which is a bummer because that means when you buy it, you're paying for a dropper, but it's not like a very desirable dropper because it doesn't get out of the way that much. Now, some people are fine with 120 and 130 mil droppers. Great. I find, especially when goofing around and trying to make it feel more like a pump track bike, Getting that dropper all the way, getting that saddle all the way out of the way makes a huge difference for bunny hops, uh, jumps, and just moving around on the bike. 
So that's not a deal breaker, but it's sad because a lot of people are still going to buy a dropper to upgrade it. And at that point, why pay for the dropper in the first place? I just want to compare this to the Habit 3. The Habit 3 has Shimano brakes, the 200 series brakes. They're not my favorite, but they work. Um, it's got Advent X, 10 speeds, same drivetrain there. A little bit lower end wheels. Uh, it's got a Suntour fork. If you're going to be replacing the fork anyway, why pay more for the Habit 2 to get a better fork? I feel like this bike deserves to be dressed with really good parts to see what it can do. We'll see on the ride feel. But that's kind of the goal for me, is find an entry-level hardtail for my patrons and for you guys who are looking for a great hardtail without breaking the bank. Finding a great one that's worth upgrading and putting a great fork on and a longer dropper and maybe a great wheel set and having a fantastic bike that you upgrade piece by piece as you can afford it. And so I'm approaching this as if this frame were the best of the best and it was worth putting really cool stuff on. I feel like it is. We'll see how it rides, but I feel like coming with the Judy is a bit of a shortcoming, coming with the 120mm dropper is a bit of a shortcoming. Granted, it's a, it's a $1,450 bike at time of filming. That's still pretty impressive for what you get, but I don't know, anyone over 180, I think you're going to find this 32 mil fork lacking. I've got kind of a, a knocking in the front end. It feels like a loose headset. It's not a loose headset. I think it's the fork. We'll see how that plays out. But, I mean, there's some really good stuff going on. Really great tires. Really great tires. Great 30i rims. We've got the 165 mil cranks, the great Advent X drivetrain. So really, apart from dropper and fork, I don't feel like anything else needs to be upgraded on this. And to be honest, this still might be fine for most people. We'll see in the ride review. There's a couple things I don't love about this. I don't love the cable guys. They're just a little bit hokey. Uh, the little cable entry ports there. It pinches your cable pretty hard, which I don't love. It's also got one of those plastic cable guides under the bottom bracket and it screws on with a Phillips. Like that just screams saving 20 cents for not just having a hex head on that because Phillips will strip out and um, I actually had to pull that off when routing the dropper so I could fit the dropper through there and I was just a little disappointed. It's that little plastic just like in the 90s those plastic guides where the cables come through and then it feeds them the, the, way, the way they want to go. Makes for a pretty tidy setup but I don't know I just think that Phillips head is the wrong way to do that. Nobody should be using Phillips heads on bikes anymore. <laughs> One other thing that needs to die, and I'm being particularly critical, these little rubber grommet plugs for the droppers, they need to go away. We need to never see those again. They just wear out over time, and especially if you're raising or lowering your dropper, you let a buddy borrow your bike, you need to raise it an inch. They just have a lot of friction. They end up like tearing. They're a pain to work on and there's better solutions. We've got to get rid of those. They're not the right solution. And so every time I see those, I'm just like, no, why? Why are we still using those rubber plugs? There are such more elegant solutions. We've also got a SRAM UDH, the universal derailleur hanger on there. Hardtails have kind of been the last bikes to get those, and it's exciting to see them coming to hardtails. This bike represents so many great things coming to hardtails. It kind of shows us the temperature of the market. The, they're not steep, sketchy XC bikes anymore. They're meant to be trail bikes that you can just kind of take anywhere and ride all over the place. So we're seeing a SRAM UDH. If you wanted to put transmission on this, knock yourself out. I like the Advent X just fine. You can use SRAM on it, you can use Shimano on it, you can use MicroShift, but if you ever need to replace that derailleur hanger, you can go into any shop and they're going to have a universal derailleur hanger. It's universal from brand to brand to brand. This bike in this price range has some competition with the Orbea Laufey, the Trek Roscoe 7, the Rocky Mountain Growler, the Ragley Big Al. If you ever want to pick my brain on how any of those bikes compare to each other and you want advice on which one to get for you, become a patron. I do that over on Patreon. It's a service that you pay for, but you get one-on-one -on -one consultation with me so I can help steer you away from bikes that aren't going to fit your riding style and area and budget well and steer you towards bikes that will. I've got no skin in the game, doesn't matter to me if you buy a Cannondale or a Trek or a Specialized or a Yeti, it, it doesn't affect me. I just wanna make sure you end up on the right bike. So if that's something you can benefit from, become a patron today. One other thing we need to do is see if this will fit a 2.6 tire in the back. So here is a 29 by 2.6 on a 40i ram. That's wider than most people will run. 
Oh man, that fits all day long. Oh, that's wild. That's over a centimeter of clearance there. Over a centimeter clearance there. Let's go bigger. I highly doubt this will fit because most bikes do not fit a tire this big. 29 by 3.0. I love getting nerdy. If this benefits you, seeing what size wheels fit on different frames, consider supporting this channel. I've got some links below. Buy me a coffee. You can kick me a couple bucks. Cannondale doesn't pay me to review their bikes. Boy, I wish they did. So if you want to see more of this, uh, consider supporting the channel so that I can make more of these videos for you. Wow, that's really surprising how much room we've got on a 3.0. I'd run it. I wouldn't run it in the UK. No, maybe I would. It's a hardtail after all. Dang, check this out. It fits 29 by 3.0 on a 45i rim. We've got 6 mil clearance there, 5 mil clearance there, and even more clearance up top. Okay, I'm seriously impressed. I did not expect this to fit. I'd run this. This fits well enough to run. That could open this up to be a really cool bike packer to have 29 by 3 O's on there. And you can, I don't know if the Judy will fit it, a Pike will fit a 29 by 3 O up front. Let's throw this on the geometer to see what the angles look like. If these measurements help you, I'd love to hear. There's a lot of work to do. Uh, it takes a lot of time to edit this and, and build this in. I'm happy to do it if you guys find it. A lot of bikes match the geo charts perfectly. A lot of them don't. And if you're shopping online and you've never thrown a leg over the bike, which is the case for most people these days, you need to know if the geo chart is accurate or not. Rear center, 435. Good, I was worried it was going to be 440. Let's see. Actual chain stay is indeed 440, but rear center is 435. Seat tube length. This is kind of landing a little ahead of the bottom bracket like we like to see. That's cool. Yeah, 395. I love that. Love the short seat tube. Bummer they didn't just run a longer dropper because if anyone could, this bike could. Front center 765. Reach is 440 on the money. Right on with the geo chart. We have a 63 mil bottom bracket drop. Stack is... 643, nice tall stack for a 130 mil. I'm glad this isn't any shorter. Bravo, Cannondale, for doing that. Head tube angle, 65.0, unsagged. Now it said 64 degree online, and I'm actually glad it's 65 and not 64. 64 is really slack, and there are a few places to really wake one of those up, so I'm actually glad it's not as slack as it shows online. We're gonna do effective seat tube here, 76.0. Two. Good, I like that. Rear end's a little bit longer than what I typically like, but I think with the slightly shorter reach, it's actually gonna be a little bit more balanced and it's gonna weight the front a little bit better so it doesn't wash out on corners. So, could be really balanced. To hit the under $1,450 price tag, you've got to make some compromises. You can't have amazing everything. One place I think they could do a little bit better is on their assembly, like the cables are a little bit long, <laughs> the shifter cable went in the wrong port. Um, that that routing through the brake was goofy. I can catch that because I build bikes all day long. A mechanic at your shop is going to catch it, so if you buy from a dealer, it's not going to be a problem for you. But if anyone's building these themselves, those are just little things that I feel like they could improve a little bit better. So it felt like all of the, the small details were paid attention to. This frame is beautiful, and I'm curious in the back of my mind, is this worth putting three or $4,000 with the parts in to have an ultimate hardtail? Or is it always gonna kind of have one leg in the entry level, affordable hardtail range, and you're never really gonna unlock it with, with you know a $2,000 wheel set or a really great fork? I don't know, I'm curious to ride it and experiment with it to see what I find out. I think this bike is absolutely beautiful. I love the maroon dark cherry color with the silver and gray. I think it pops really good. I think the lines look really good. It's just a clean looking bike. I think Cannondale's done some really modern stuff on this. And in some ways Cannondale's pretty future thinking and in some ways they've kind of been stuck in the past a little bit. This gives me great hope seeing this hardtail. I think in the next three to five years, most companies are gonna have trail hardtails figured out to the point where a new rider can go and buy one for 1200 to 1800 and get a great riding bike and have a blast on it for a couple years till they know exactly what type of riding they're going to do 
and what they want, or maybe they'll just keep upgrading this to their heart's content to make it work for them. I like the drivetrain. I love the price, 1500 bucks, and even that Habit 3 still has the same frame, same through axle. Most companies cheap out, and when they go to the lower end frame, it's got that quick release axle. We don't want that, especially on hardtails. It's nice to see a through axle here. So once again, this is not a review. This is a first look where I show you some things that you couldn't find out online. A lot of people will make a YouTube video, call it a review when they're just reading the specs to you. That's not a review. You gotta get on the bike and test it out and compare it with other well-known hardtails. And that's what this channel's all about. So if you want to see how this stacks up compared to other hardtails, make sure you're subscribed so you're notified when that video does drop. The next video is to take this on the trail, get it dirty, and to see where it excels and to see where it struggles and to see if that matches your needs. Super excited to take this thing on the trail and see what it rides like. I've got some hunches on how it might ride, but I've been wrong before on those hunches from the first look in Geo, so I can't wait to throw a leg over it. Thanks for watching everybody. There's a party in the mountains and you're invited.